Michael Bates is in Butler. He'll be here tonight sharing his testimony about how God saved him and what God has done in his life, what he continues to do in his life, and Pressing on Ministries, what their purpose and goals are, why they exist in their ministry, and I want to invite you to, to hear this, and we'll have a time, I think, for a question and answer if you like. And all, all of this is, is uh, designed, it's, the purpose is that we will eventually consider, seriously consider bringing Dan on as a missionary. This is an evangelistic, uh, discipleship kind of ministry. It's a great compliment for our church and the things that we do already, and um, I'm very excited about the potential and the possibility, so be sure and be here tonight to, um, to hear this. Beloved, I am, I am, uh, I am struck. I am, I'm almost speechless, but, you know, I'm a preacher, so I'm not speechless. Almost speechless uh, over this psalm. This is a, it's just, as the title says, it's an extraordinary psalm. Extraordinary psalm. Now, the last time that we were together on this particular topic, our conclusion from the study of Psalms 2 and 110 were this. God has made many promises to the nation Israel in Old Testament times, which were dependent upon one for their fulfillment. This one would be the natural son of David, according to the promise, from you will come one. The natural son of David, but more than that, one who would rule on the throne of David in Jerusalem for God forever. That was the promise given to him. The fulfillment of these prophecies to the fathers necessitated a man who would be more than a man. More than a man. Now we had a hint way back in Genesis 3.15. Remember there's a certain hint that this one will bruise Satan on the head. So we think that perhaps there's something to this man, extraordinary, because he's going to hurt, he's going to destroy eventually a supernatural being. And how can a natural man do something like that to a supernatural being? So that's a very slight hint. But the fulfillment of these prophecies necessitated a man who would be more than a man. And so God sent his eternal son, Jesus Christ, the greater son of David as well, to offer to Israel the kingdom promised to them in order to fulfill all the conditions of that case, this one had to be both God and man. And so we have in Psalms 2 and Psalm 110, conversations in the Trinity, my God, my Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Remember that. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 5. You have conversations going on in the Trinity. So we have a strong theme from Genesis all the way up to David. A strong theme that he would be king and he would rule and he would be strong and he would dominate. and He would bring peace. All of those are very strong themes. But in Psalms 2 and 110, we have for the first time indication that this is going to be more than a mortal man. It's going to be God and man. God and man. So the Old Testament saint from the time of David on, the Old Testament saint knew that this was going to be a divine kind of man. Not merely flesh and blood, but something more than that. That's why uh, Nathaniel's statement in John chapter 1, remember Nathaniel's statement in John chapter 1, it's so understanding what we understand now, beloved. Reading Nathaniel's statement, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. He got it. He connected all of those statements, Psalms and 2 Samuel 7 with Deuteronomy 18, he connected all of those and his statement was, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. He said it, he knew it. What a glorious recognition that must have been for Nathaniel. And for us to study this and come to this conclusion that we also have begun to understand what Nathaniel knew, it's, it's speechless. Just in a phenomenal God, the wise God who has done all of this. 
Understand this, beloved. He has never let his people go without hope. He has never let them go a day without being reminded through scripture that he has not forgotten them, that he will not forget them, that he will fulfill all that he says he would fill. He is a God who keeps his word. He is a covenant-keeping God. This is your God. This is my God. This is the one who has promised never to leave us and nothing can separate us from him. Amazing statement that we have nothing to do but to fall on our face and worship this awesome God. Today we're going to examine another psalm, an extraordinary psalm. This psalm will introduce on a grand scale the theme of suffering. It's there. Up to this point, we've seen zero on suffering. But now in Psalm 22, it comes through the doorway. It bursts both doors open in all of its glory and all of its splendor. And it's right there in black and white in front of us in Psalm 22. Again, as in the previous Psalms that we studied, this one will just simply flatten you. It will just lay you out and there's... There's, it's an act of holiness almost to remain silent before a holy God. The psalmist finds himself in dire straits. Nick read the psalm throughout earlier and we'll continue to read sections as we go through here. But the psalmist finds himself in a real problem, in a real dire straits. The enemy thirsts for his life. Their pursuit is without rest. All avenues of escape seem blocked. Despair knocks and then pounds on the mind. Loneliness begins to engulf any hope. The peril is imminent. And then the psalmist cries out to God for help. According to the inscription, and you can read that, the Psalm of David. This is a Psalm of David. There is no reason to doubt that. But as with Psalm 2, we know of no circumstance, we know of, there's not a circumstance that we are aware of in David's life that's recorded in Scripture that is similar to or as intense as Psalm 22. Nothing in David's life compares to the intensity that's expressed here in Psalm 22. An older commentary suggest a possible slice of time during Saul's persecution of David in the desert of Maon. Remember in 1 Samuel chapter 23, we studied that. A time perhaps earlier in the days of David, earlier in chapter 20 and 21, when he was alone and suffering incessantly at the hand of Saul. Or maybe a time when he was escaping for him from his son Absalom. It's difficult to pinpoint anything here. Nevertheless, the inability to identify a historical occasion does not weaken David's authorship. It's very clear. It is a psalm of David. So the psalm at the most, at the most, is a general reflection of David's public life. And such experiences are recorded again in 2 Samuel chapter 22. Sometime you can look over at chapter 22 of 2 Samuel and there's like 50, over 50 verses talking about David's life and there is talk of despair and God, where are you? There are, as we will see, descriptions of suffering and events that are well beyond David and in fact fulfilled only in Jesus Christ. For example, the intensity of the grief and the completeness and glory of the deliverance and the triumph toward the end of the psalm both appear to be unsuitable depictions of any human being, any mere human being. If you just glance over to verse 30, verse 30 and 31, posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to be To the coming generation, they will come and declare his righteousness. That seems well beyond any mortal king in that description. And there are others like that as well. It is impossible, one commentator says, to describe the sadness, the humility, 
the tenderness, the longing of this complaint. The psalm is not a description of an illness. It is a description of an execution, particularly a crucifixion. David never knew about or endured the pain of crucifixion. Crucifixion was not practiced for hundreds of years after David. That's James Montgomery Boyce in his commentary. In a strong case for this being a messianic psalm are the words in the first clause of verse 1 of chapter 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's quoted in John chapter 19. And the psalm, in 20, Psalm 22 and verse 18, is quoted as being fulfilled in John 19 verse 24. And verse 22 of this psalm by the writer of Hebrews in chapter 2 and verse 12. Those are your strongest cases for this being a messianic psalm. Other arguments are valid as well, but this be your strongest. You have direct quotations and a statement of fulfillment. Direct citations of the psalm occur in 14 times in the New Testament. Now I mentioned this a moment ago, there's an undeniable expansion from Israel to the very ends of the earth. And of course that was never the case with David, nor has it been with any king, human king. That's in verses 27 through 31. The only individual through whose person God deals with the nations is the Davidic king, is the Messiah, the Son of God. And another commentator, Derek Kidner, says, No Christian can read this without being vividly confronted with the crucifixion. It is not only a matter of prophecy minutely fulfilled, but of the sufferer's humility. There is no plea for vengeance and his vision of a worldwide ingathering of the Gentiles. This psalm anticipates the crucifixion of the anointed one, Messiah. Phenomenal statements. Israel knew that her coming king was going to die, was going to be crucified. And they knew it. They knew it a thousand years before he came. What happened? What happened in the following years that they would elevate so much so this kingly aspect, this ruling aspect, and seemingly forget all of the other information? So, Charles Spurgeon says we should read reverently, putting off our shoes from our feet as Moses did at the burning bush. For if there be holy ground anywhere in Scripture, it is in this psalm. The outline is very simple. There are two points to the outline. There is appeal for help in verses 1 through 21, and then there is thanksgiving and praise. And you might notice, did you, as it was being read early in verse 22 there was a sharp turn in the reading I will tell of your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly I will praise you that's quoted in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12 the first section the appeal for help is marked by a plea for deliverance from distress at the beginning and the end you might ask, how do we know where the divisions occur at the beginning and at the end? Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 21, save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen you answered me. So you have bookends, as it were, in, this, in the Hebrew that boxes off this section. The second section, thanksgiving and praise, is bracketed as well by the theme of declaring or proclaiming God's name. So in verse 22, I will tell of your name to my brethren. And then it expands in verse 31, they will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed it, that it is finished. You recognize that verse? 
My God, my God, it is finished. You want to know where it got, where it came from? Psalm 22. Psalm 22. The foundation of the psalm is the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenants. Apart from these divinely initiated commitments on God's part, the psalmist has absolutely no reason to cry out and to make these appeals. It would be a shot in the dark, so to speak. But God has made himself known. He has made these commitments. No commitments by God means, of course, no hope of anything beyond what mere human eyes can see. From the psalmist's perspective, his predicament is that there is no hope. There is no way out of this. I will tell of your name. Yet verse 22 and following, the drastic shift. If that were true, the latter section, section verses 22 to 31, would not have been written. And there would be no thanksgiving and there would be no praise but there is praise and there is thanksgiving because God has taken the initiative to make a covenant with Israel and he has taken initiative to save people. And so there is thanksgiving and there is hope and there is praise. Now this appeal for help is the lament side of this. And we'll, you'll see the back and forth. We're going to go from the psalmist is desperate and then he's going to reflect on God who's constant. And then he's going he's, he's to show himself to be despised and then he's going to give a testimony of God's committed nature, committed word. He's going to go back and forth. But this appeal for help is the lament. And the lament in verse 22 and following burst forth in a flood of praise because God has committed himself he has promised and so there is no despair there is no desperate condition so the appeal the lament the thanksgiving and praise that burst forth like a flood so let's look and we'll go back and forth let's look at this psalm the appeal for help in verses 1 through 21 first of all the desperate nature of the psalmist the desperate nature of the psalmist in verses one and two. This is his complaint. It's a pained and anguished cry that resembles the roar of a lion. He's crying out. The psalmist is grieved because God has not responded to his crisis or to his cries. Moses cried, the psalmist knows, and God answered. Joshua cried and God answered. Abraham cried and God answered. But I'm crying, Father, why do you not hear me? That's his cry. Why do you not respond to my prayers? Do you not understand this situation? Do you not understand the pain, the loneliness, the separation from my people? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God answered, but where is God now? Where can I go? No one can help me. I'm beyond the doctor's help. I'm beyond, I'm beyond saving. Nobody's gonna jump in here and rescue me. Nobody can. The situation has gotten that bad. It's beyond human ability to save. And then he imagines himself forsaken and forgotten, even rejected by God. Even rejected. This is not the cry of impatience or despair. It's the cry of a lost child calling out to his father, wondering why his father doesn't come to his rescue. Desperate. Doesn't understand why his father has left him. And he does not have an answer for why God is not responding. That's in a de situation of being desperate. I don't know why God is not responding. I have no answers. The famous first line, my God, my God, has an emphasis. And the emphasis is on my, not God. Sometimes we hear in slang and taking the Lord's name in vain we hear the emphasis on the opposite we hear the emphasis on God oh my and that 
syllable, that single syllable seems to get elongated a little bit. But the emphasis in the Hebrew is on my. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the emphasis. As he's desperate and he's crying out. Why, my God, do you not answer? And Christ, of course, used this language And he repeated this, and the words are understood in their literal sense. He was crying out. And it's not just a brief kind of time in his life. Seemingly, verse 2 tells us, Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. By day and by night. The day and night is an expression to encompass the totality, everything. It's the totality expressed in abbreviated form is what that is. By day and by night, it means all the time. Every time I pray, for example, all the time, by day and by night, whenever I pray, you are just not there. It seems like you're not there. The point that God does not answer his continual cry to him. And as we quoted from an older commentator before, it's impossible to describe the sadness, the humility, the tenderness, and the longing of this complaint. When God abandons you, there is no hope. The blackest night becomes as day when God abandons you. The blackest night that you've ever known. The death of spouse, the death of children, parents. The blackest it you could possibly conceive it to be would be like night if God abandoned you. Your life would just probably cease to exist. In fact, Isaiah says, should the Lord draw his breath back, nothing would it live. Nothing would live. So where does he go from here? He turns in verses three through five to a confession of trust. This is the Lord who is constant. Who is constant. You have desperate condition met by a confession of trust, the constant God. So what does he say? Yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you your fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. Rehearsing history. How God had been faithful to them in the past. So he reminds himself of God's holy nature and his past goodness to the forefathers. How he delivered them. How he came to the rescue. Because God is the holy one, he justly, of course, was the object of Israel's praise. Praises here is plural. It's a reference to the many acts of deliverance that God performed and that bring thankful remembrance to David here in this case. It's a very common, very common method of Scripture to rehearse God's faithfulness. And it's something, beloved, I would encourage you to do. Rehearse the Lord's faithfulness in your life. Psalm 71 Psalm 71, you who have taken me from the womb, you have protected me, you have guarded me, you have done all of these things, and that's the prayer of an old man. He's rehearsing the faithfulness of God to give me strength and encouragement for today. So from this point of desperation, this is what he does. Reminds himself of God's many acts of deliverance to his people. He calls God holy. Holiness, of course, is the the cornerstone, the quintessential attribute of God. Although God seemingly does not now listen to the psalmist's cries and so deliver him, verses one and two, he knows that God is holy and has answered the cries of his covenant people before. And so he is capable of doing that. His past faithfulness in Israel's history is the foundation for the psalmist's personal faith in this moment. And I would suggest to you, beloved, that you are not 
any different. God's past faithfulness and his promises to you as well are the foundation for your personal faith today. As you reflect back on all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and you have done that, you've confessed your sins. You have trusted him for the forgiveness of your sins. You've come to the point where you realize you can't save yourself. Why do I need saving? Because we're born sinners. We're born with a bent to please self, to be selfish, to take things that are not ours, to lie, to look after us primarily and only in many cases, most cases. That's the way, that's our condition. That's how we came into this world. Therefore, the appropriate to you, verse five, is emphatic. To you, they cried out and were delivered. In you, they trusted and were not disappointed. God is a God who does not disappoint. He's incapable of producing disappointment in his people. To you and to no other gods, no one else. The psalmist rehearsing God's faithfulness to encourage himself God already knows himself. The psalmist is not reminding God. He's not calling on God to be faithful. He's reminding himself of God's faithfulness. God knows this about himself already. So you have the desperate condition and then he reminds himself of God's constant nature, his constant commitment. And then despised. The despised condition regarded by others of the psalmist. This is his complaint again. Verses six through eight. And I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with their lip. They wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. Not only forsaken, but totally shamed by people. This has much more of an effect on younger people. When you get a certain age and you realize the truth, what the truth is, you know, it really doesn't matter what people think. I'm really not too concerned about what people think. If they think wrong things of me and they are unjustified, I'm disturbed about that. I wish they wouldn't. But if they think things of me because they are true, because I have pursued my God, because I have devoted myself to following him, because I do believe in this crazy story called creation, because I do believe in those, then I'm not concerned what they think about that. They're not my judge. God alone will judge me. He alone is the judge, and he's the one that I seek to please, not those around him. But that's, that's an evidence of a, certain level of maturity and young people struggle with this they are affected they are concerned about what people think about them and we pray don't we not pray for our children pray for one another that they would regard the evaluation of almighty God far above anything that their peers might say about them isn't that, our, is that not our desire for our children? That they would not be moved by public opinion? That they would not be shaken by the, by the opinion or the view of someone, someone else? That they would be steadfast, steady, unmovable, unwavering? The psalmist was despised by people. He calls himself a mere worm. That's a metaphor. It's a word picture of lowliness and humiliation. His peers, the text says, wag their head. It's not in comparison, or excuse me, not in compassion here that they wag their head, but it is in malicious joy. Huh. This, is, this is not a challenge, an encouraging challenge to trust God. This is a scornfully challenge to trust God. You trust, that is, commit yourself in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver you. And that's done scornfully with, with a, a very disparaging attitude. 
Look at him. Look, you trust God. You keep telling me that Jesus saves and there's no other savior. Now you're in this situation. Now you trust him and let him get you out. That's the attitude that's coming across. A scornful, challenging, the psalmist to trust God. The basic word, or the basic meaning of the word trust or commit is to be round. Interesting, isn't it? To be round or to roll. Thought that was interesting when I studied that. So employed in this figure, uh, employed in a figurative way, used in a figurative way, rolling oneself on the Lord so to trust him or to commit one's behavior and life to him. That's the idea. So you roll to the Lord's arms and you stay there. That's the picture. To trust him. The faithful believer is to commit his whole life, his whole life situation to God, who alone can grant him success. That's what they're scornfully calling him to do. Trust no one but God. Roll yourself on him. If you say he can deliver you, if he can give you these things, if he can make you well, roll yourself on him. Trust, commit yourself to him. Listen to Joshua chapter 5 and verse 9. Today I have rolled away, there's your word, I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the name of this place is called Gilgal. Gilgal means to roll away, to trust, to commit. The Aramaic form of the word was to be ever remembered, or forever remembered in the Greek New Testament as the place of our Savior's crucifixion. The Aramaic form of Gilgal is Golgotha. So where does the psalmist go from here? From this point of being despised by everyone, he reflects back on the character of God. God is committed Verses 9 and 10. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. He knows God is the one who is committed to him. His confidence that God has been with him all along, ever since his birth. Indeed, he learned trust. It says, look in verse 9, you made me trust when upon my mother's breast. In fact, that trust back in verses 4 and 5, in your fathers, excuse me, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted in you and you delivered them. So he learned trust even as a nursing infant. They mock in his trust, but he focuses on what he knows of God as the lens through which to view his circumstances. I am no different than my fathers. I have trusted Yahweh as my God. He delivered and he can deliver me. That's his hope. That's his strength for today is that God has been faithful from the very beginning and that he will not be unfaithful. He will not disappoint in the future. The idea is that this relationship was of the longest Possible standing is strongly emphasized by the fourfold statement of birth images. He says, out of the womb, upon my mother's breast, from birth, from my mother's womb. You get the idea? This is the longest possible standing relationship in his life. And he has never let him down. He's never disappointed to this point. And so he will not despair. He will not be desperate. But then he goes right back to being distraught, the psalmist. And this section right here in verses 11 through 18 is the most intense description of suffering in this psalm. Here is the plea for God's presence in the midst of his agonizing trials. Here is his call for God to deliver him. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help words cannot express the loneliness 
the desperate situation of this complaint. There is none to help. Verse 1, the psalmist says, Why are you so far? Verse 11, you have the plaintive cry, Be not far, for trouble is near. You see how the psalmist is going back and forth. There is a real struggle going on. The same thing that happens with you and I, beloved. In principle, the same thing. We, dis- we get discouraged. We begin to worry. We go back and forth. We go back and forth. Do you not? Or am I the only one here? Back and forth. Yes, trust the Lord. And then I uh, start worrying. And yes, and I've got to trust the Lord. I can't, it's beyond my control. I can't control the hearts of people or what other people do. Back and forth. The distance between the psalmist and God is the problem. That distance is the problem. Where are you? There is no help. There is none to save. There is not explicit prayer for healing or deliverance from death. The prayer begins with the request for the removal of of the distance he wants to be close to his God now David has expressed this in other places remember how I long to be in the temple with God's people in the tabernacle how I long to be in your presence David longs he loves that fellowship he loves that association the peace and the joy that surrounds him And the distance is what he's trying to reconcile. He's not, he didn't pray for healing or deliverance, but that that distance would be minimized. He feels forsaken. Be not far, he says. His greatest desire is to once again know the intimate presence of his God. His enemies are described as strong bulls in verse 12, raving and roaring lions in verse 13, and vicious wild dogs that prowl the streets. We read of this great sense of loneliness and helplessness. There is no one to help. In verses 12 and 13, that statement there of the bulls, they open wide their mouths, that's... It's not describing a bullfighting arena. That's what we call hyperbole. It's exaggerated to emphasize a point. It points to, these strong bulls point to strength and fierceness versus weakness and vulnerability. That's the idea, that's the point. These bulls of Bashan, the cows of Bashan grazed on very, very fertile fields, and they, were, they had a reputation for being strong and big. So you take that reputation of being big and strong, much stronger than a man, you see it, it's formidable, and you put that in this picture here. That's his point. The mention of their teeth, the lion's teeth, the paw or the mouth called to mind great fear, The mouth of the lion was a a predicament, a situation from which escaped seemed hopeless. In verses 14 and 15, the effects of their treatment are given here. Verses 14 and 15, the psalmist is emotionally and he's physically drained. I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melted within me. The images of the poured out water and the dislocated bones describe the loss of physical strength while the melted heart of wax describes his loss of emotional strength. There is just nothing there. When God leaves, there's nothing there. The description of physical dryness Conveyed by the figure of David's description of his tongue sticking to the inside of his mouth. All of his vital fluids were draining away and with them his strength was draining as well. 
The last line of verse 15 is addressed to God himself because the psalmist realizes that the sovereign God is the ultimate cause behind all that he is enduring. Isn't that fascinating? Look at that. You lay me in the dust of death. There's a recognition that God is behind all of this. He's crying out to be close to his God. And at the same time, he knows that his gracious Father is allowing all this, doing all of this to him. Death, death must be the end, and the psalmist knows that it is God's doing. We're reminded of Peter's words just after Pentecost, his first sermon in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Peter says this, This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. God was indeed doing it. He's doing it for his glory though. Verse 16, another exaggerated kind of statement, hyperbole. Hyperbole is an expression, and of course the point of that is vividness and imagery. Big cows, strong cows, dogs, lion, you get the imagery of all of that. The enemy surrounding him like a pack of predatory dogs, he is helpless prey. He was merely a bag of useless bones, verse seven, 17 says this. It's small wonder then that his enemies do, the, do what? Stare and gloat over him. He was indeed a sight to behold. Because the way that he looked was so drained, disfigured, as if that were not enough. In verse 18, the last act of indignity, the psalmist pictures his enemies watching for his death so that they can strip his body and share his garments among them. That is quoted as being fulfilled so that scripture might be fulfilled in John 19. Verses 23 and 24. And yet the psalmist responds in verses 19 through 21 with the competent thinking of the competent nature of God. It's the psalmist's assurance. This is his assurance. Again, introduced by the plaintive cry, he says in verse 19, But you, O Lord, be not far off, O oh, you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword. That plaintive cry begins, but a renewed petition to God. But you, O oh Lord, be not far off. But you is emphatic there, as it was in an earlier case. The resolve to trust against overwhelming odds. No matter what they may say or what they may do, I will not abandon you. I will trust you. I will be there. You will find me faithful when you come. Should you look in, you will find me faithful wherever I am. So in verse 1, why are you so far? Verse 11, be not far from me. Verse 19, with greater emphasis, but you. But you. You are not like a God who disappoints. All other gods disappoint. They are simply the imagination of men put into forms, carved out of wood and gold. You do not disappoint, God, but you, but you be not far off, O Lord. He's calling on God to intervene quickly with short, abrupt statements of urgency. And then, all of a sudden, verse 22 and following. Thanksgiving and praise. There's a noticeable change of tone. You saw that. So extreme was this change of tone that some have insisted that this was at some point a separate psalm that was somewhere down through the history was attached to the end of psalm, uh, the end of verse 21. But there's no evidence of that at all. Nothing of, no, no reason at all 
that we should think that. The, rather than lament and please for help, the psalmist now sounds the note of victory. The note of victory. He had been delivered. God answered his cries. He responded to him. Therefore, he now turns to give thanks and praise to the Lord, and he invites others to join with him as he praises the Lord. So he turns first in verses 22 through 26 to all Israel. All Israel, I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him. When he cried to him but when he cried to him for help, he heard. God was listening after all. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. Once feeling forsaken, but now he knows that God did not in fact despise his affliction. He began by crying out for help with no apparent answer, but now perceives that God had in fact heard him and has answered him. Instead of the scorn and threat of evil men, he will be surrounded by a company of godly ones in praise. Instead of laments at the encroachment of death, he can offer the godly ones, may your hearts live forever. I think, of, I think of the men in England who were burned at the stake. Several men, lots of people were burned at the stake in what, was, what history has come to know as Bloody Mary. Lots of men were burned at the stake. And when that was taking place, perhaps they thought of Psalm 22. And they wondered where God was. But, just as in our Savior's case, in their case as well, there is that abrupt change, a drastic change of tone so extreme beginning at verse 22. Because once their light, so to speak, their life went out, they were in the presence of their Lord. They were in the presence of godly ones probably praising God probably praising God and beloved that's exactly where you're going to be it's exactly where you're going to be we have no idea what awaits us whether it's death through injury sickness old age we have no idea and frankly I don't want to know I have no idea but I do know that whatever the case may be the abrupt change from 1 through 21 to 22 to 31 would be the case in our life as well. It will be the case. All of this has taken place. Declaring God's name was a significant act in the Old Testament. He says, I will declare your name. That's significant. Names were extremely important. Be used not only being used not only to identify persons, but at times to be descriptive of one's nature or one's character. Theologically, the term name designates the revealed character and reputation of God. When you say, I will reveal your name, you're talking about talking about his character and his person and all that he is. I will tell people about you, God. I will reveal your name. I will tell of your name. May your name be exalted above all the heavens and the earth. May the knowledge of your name, your character, be known. That's what he's praying for. That's what it is. It's a significant statement. David's praise of God's name, thus it involves all that he knows God to be and have 
what God has done for him. That's called a testimony. That's what we hear every time we hear a baptism. We hear a testimony. I will tell of what God has done for me. And there are some, I, we, I love to hear baptismal testimonies. I am so overwhelmed by how God acts and what he uses. Uh, he certainly uses scripture, but the, the, the other things that God uses are simply phenomenal. How he works so many fronts all at the same time to bring about his grand purpose. It's just a testimony. That's what he says. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. I will give record. I will give account for how you have demonstrated faithfulness, is what David says. You're going to hear another one tonight of God's demonstrated faithfulness in a man, in a couple. Interesting here that praise is in a social context. You notice that? Indicating a restoration to a sense of community. Remember, I was all alone, loneliness. Now he's back in fellowship. He's in community with other people. And so all of this praise takes place in the sense, in the restoration of a sense of community. The psalmist will like, express his gratitude by offering, and he will. You see, notice offering, I will pay my offerings, I will do these things. And so he's expressing his thanksgiving and he's going to invite the poor to a meal so that they can share his happiness and sing a new song of praise and thanksgiving with him. It's very unselfish. God has delivered him. There's a sense that what God has done for him, other people need to know. The blessings that God has given to him, other people need to experience. Everybody come, I want to tell you this. Indeed, what Christ has accomplished on the cross, all the blessings will be ours. Ours. And we have the seal of the Spirit, Ephesians 1, 12, 13, and 14. We have the seal of the Spirit, the guarantee, the down payment, that all that God has promised will come to fruition. It will happen. And then we will get to tell and give testimony. And we should be doing that here as well. He invites all those in the covenant community who also fear the Lord to join him in genuine worship. Notice verse 26. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. And then from there, he expands, and this is a big reason why we would say that this psalm is messianic. It goes beyond any human king because of the expansion from his people Israel to all the earth in verses 27 through 31. All the earth. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will worship before you for the kingdom is the Lord's. That's the reason. That's the reason why they will, because the kingdom is the Lord's. And he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him. Those who are sick, even he who cannot keep his soul alive. Posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that it is finished. He has done it. The praise and the worship of the Lord will not only be on his lips and those of the assembled congregation, but will come from all the families of the nations all over the earth to the ends of the earth. And the reason, as we noted while I go in verse 28, such description transcends anything that could be attributed to the suffering of a Israel, a mortal, purely mortal Israelite king. You see the context here in verse 27 and following erupts in a declaration of future hope. A declaration of future hope. In verses 30 and 31, the term seed there, posterity is the word seed. 
The word seed speaks of God's promised spiritual remnant that extends from Abraham to its culmination in the acting out of the new covenant. David's great heir, the Messiah. Reference to that would be Ezekiel 37, verses 18 through 28. Great passage. The psalm ends in a glorious crescendo. If it, if it were possible to crescendo any higher, it does. It ends in a glorious crescendo. The last two verses round out the picture that tells that the effects of this great deliverance shall be universal. The last line, as we've noted before, should be familiar. My God, my God, it is finished. Those statements come from this psalm. God's de demonstrated righteousness will be broadcast to the world. In that glorious future, the Lord's words through Isaiah will be fully realized. Listen to this in Isaiah 51 and verse 6 and verse 8. My salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never fail. My righteousness will last forever. My salvation through all generations. Is this not a most extraordinary psalm? Indeed. The appeal for help in verses 1 through 21. Desperate character of God. Despised the character of God. Encouraging. Distraught in the character of God. And then the thanksgiving and praise in verses 22 through 31. All of Israel and then expands to all the earth. So this psalm is among those writings of Moses and includes all the prophets, of course, that point to Jesus as the anointed one. Luke chapter 24 and verse 44. He began to teach them from Moses the prophets and the Psalms, all that pertain to him. This is one of them from the Psalms. This Psalm elevates the necessity for him to suffer. The necessity for him to suffer is here, Psalm 22. And you know where we need to go next. We have to go to Isaiah 53 next. There are other Psalms that we could go to. But we have to get to Isaiah 53. We have to see and examine that momentous statement that's made in that prophet. The psalm went on to prophesy, this psalm went on to prophesy the vindication and a restoration, not simply the necessity to suffer, but also vindication and restoration is all here. It looked for a worldwide praise of God. So this psalm by our Lord gives all of us readers today, all of readers throughout all time, a source of assurance and a completed, uh, excuse me, a source of assurance that completed redemption in Christ's sacrificial death and resurrection and confidence in the full realization of God's covenant with David. It's all here. More assurance of what God has said. And there's one other thing here. Just one other thing. You note that from all Israel to the, to the ends of the world. And what are we told to do as a church? The ends of the world, right? The ends of the world. It serve, this psalm should serve as a missionary imperative to proclaim his righteousness, verse 31, and proclaim salvation in Christ to the ends of the earth. It's coming. We are merely heralding the truth that's coming, announcing the coming kingdom, as in the Sermon on the Mount, the character of those who will inherit the kingdom, announcing that a savior and a judge is coming. And that to escape judgment, to escape destruction, they must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation to the ends of the earth, which will 
one day acknowledge, all the ends of the earth will one day acknowledge him as Savior. Philippians chapter 2 and verses 9 through 11. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Not to saving grace, but they will confess that indeed Christ Jesus is God's Son. He is the Messiah. I'll leave you with that. The responsibility is ours. The privilege is ours. Beloved, this is phenomenal truth given to David, to us. How is it that God could have a relationship with people like us? Himself being so holy, so other than like us. How could he have a relationship with people? How can he save by sending his son, Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully man, just like you read in the book of Psalms, Genesis through Psalms, just like you read. It's the only way, beloved, it's the only way you and I can have life. There is one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. But through me. That's it. It's so simple. It's so clear. It's so right there. It's not difficult to understand. But your pride and your sense of fairness, whatever that is, just will not accept it. Refuse to accept it. But I implore you and I beg of you today as Paul does, believe this simple message of the truth. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the King of Israel. He has died on the cross for sins and it is finished. That aspect of his work. The payment for sin is done. And the promise given to us is that all who call upon him will be saved. Are you saved? Are you just playing church? Our Father, we thank you for this glorious, extraordinary psalm. Lord, the lengths, the extent, the, all that you have done for us, so unworthy as we were, as we are, all of this you have done. And then you graciously grant us to be a part of it. Our Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word. It is a, a grand psalm, a grand statement. Father, we understand that our salvation would have been and would be impossible apart from a fully man and a fully God being brought together in one man, the man Jesus. Father, we thank you for going to such extremes as you have in order to gather a people throughout all the ages to worship and exalt your Son for all eternity. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of this, for granting us life. May we be found faithful. And may you strengthen us, Father. We will go back and forth as the psalmist did. We battle our own flesh. We battle our own laziness. We battle our, the bents in our life that take us away from you. Father, strengthen us so that we would be found faithful. Strengthen our resolve to not sin, but to live righteously each day that we live. Help us not to care. In, a, in an appropriate way, help us not to be concerned with what others think. May we regard your evaluation of us far more important than anyone else's. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen.